Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to say that our first keynote speaker is a colleague of mine. Tim Harford works for the BBC, but apart from the fact that we both work for a public broadcaster and that we are both called Tim, there is very little comparison. One and a half million copies did he sell of his famous book, The Undercover Economists. He's responsible for several podcasts at the BBC that conquered the world, such as More or Less, a dubious smackdown, uh, sorry, a genial smackdown of dubious statistics, and 50 Things That Make Modern Economy, a series which has been recently developed into a book. Today, he will talk to us about what we are getting wrong about technology and how that will affect our lives. Tim Harford. In 2002, I was working on the manuscript for this book that Tim very kindly mentioned, The Undercover Economist. And I, I was stuck. Nobody wanted to publish the book. And I was really looking for something to say about the question of globalization. And uh, I came here to Antwerp to visit some friends. I wasn't really thinking about the book at all. I was drinking Westmala Triple, I went to Fritur number one, I had Frit, I mean, I was having a nice time. And about 150 meters away from where we are now, on the balcony of my friend's flat, I sat with the manuscript, and I, I think I remember rightly, I also had a beer, and I asked myself, how do I communicate the power of this force of globalization? And I looked around me at the, the port of Antwerp and the new buildings that were going on, and I thought about hundreds of years of history of how this city had engaged with the world. And I realized that I had the solution to the final chapter of The Undercover Economist. So here we're, we're under the auspices of the districts of creativity, and we're talking about creativity. But for me, this city was an important creative moment, and I'm very, very glad to be back. Thank you for having me. But as well as talking about creativity, I'm here to talk about technology. And as Tim mentioned, I, I've been doing this fun project for the BBC. I've been working on a podcast, a series, a book called 50 Things That Made the Modern Economy. And I've tried to look at the unexpected things. I've, I've tried to look, for example, um, at the contraceptive pill or the elevator. Um, things you might not expect. And what I want to talk to you about this morning is what I've learned about the mistakes that we make when we think about technology. And not for the first time, I'm going to talk about how technology is imagined in film. I am, of course, going to choose the very best science fiction film that was ever made, Blade Runner. And I'm going to show you, well, here, it's a piece of technology. It looks like the a beautiful, beautiful woman who's smoking. smoking. Don't smoke, by the way, it's very bad for you. It looks like a beautiful woman who's smoking, but of course, those of you who've watched Blade Runner, which I hope is most of you, will know that this isn't a woman at all. This is a, a kind of robot, an organic robot, an artificial intelligence called Rachel. And she's so sophisticated that human beings can't distinguish her from a human being without training and special equipment. In fact, she's so sophisticated, even she believes that she is a human. She has human memories uploaded into her synthetic brain. It's an unbelievable piece of technology. 
And of course, when our hero, Rick Deckard, played by Harrison Ford, meets Rachel, even though it is his job to track down these organic robots and, if necessary, to kill them, he falls in love with her. She's so beautiful, she's so seductive, she's so interesting that he falls in love with a piece of technology. And of course, what do you do when you fall in love with somebody? You ask them out on a date. And how would you ask somebody out on a date? Well, it's, it's very simple. You go to a box on the wall of a bar, and you put money into it, you pick up the handset, and you make the phone call. Of course, because this is the future, it's a video call. But basically, nothing has really changed. We still have the same vision. This movie was made in the mid-1980s, and it has a mid-1980s vision of what a phone box looks like. You put your money in, it's covered in graffiti, it's covered in scrolls. You phone up the person of your dreams, and of course, she says no. Uh, and that's what happens to Rick Deckard. And when I looked at this film, which is a great film, it's well worth watching again. When I looked at this film, I realized that this scene perfectly encapsulates the two big mistakes that we make when we're talking about technology. Yeah, yeah, we get things wrong, of course. We can't see into the future, of course. But I'm talking about something more specific than simply not understanding what the future will hold. So what are the, what are the two mistakes that we make? Well, the first one is really typified by Rachel herself. Rachel is this amazing piece of technology, this organic robot, this artificial intelligence, human memories uploaded into her brain. And the first mistake I think we make when we think about technology is that we focus on the most sophisticated, spectacular, and magical examples. And that's been true for a long time. So let me give you an example from hundreds of years ago. When I was working on this book, 50 Things That Made the Modern Economy, everybody told me, you must talk about the Gutenberg printing press, this amazing technology to, to forge typed letters and then to be able to fix them so you can print, print different pages, but you can print the page over and over again it revolutionized Europe, made Europe for the first time the leading technological and cultural power on the planet. It gave us wars. It gave us civilization, novels, textbooks, newspapers. And of course, the Gutenberg Press changed the world. So I went to look at a Gutenberg Bible. Here's a Gutenberg Bible, beautiful, amazing object. It's hard to believe that it was printed. It's, it's designed to rival the organic artisanal calligraphy of the monks. You know, kind of, I have a hipster vision of what monks look like. And yes, the, the color here, the graphics, they were added by hand, but these dense columns of Latin text, they're printed. It's a miracle, a miracle, amazing technology. But the question I have, What's that printed on? And the answer is paper. And you see, paper is the technology that I think we're overlooking here. Paper was invented in China 2,000 years ago. They didn't know what to do with it originally. They used it as, well, for wrapping presents, which I guess we still use paper for wrapping presents today. It took a while before it occurred to the Chinese, you could write on it. And then it moved to the Arabic world, but it didn't move to Europe for a long time. We resisted. And we resisted because, well, why would you want paper? Paper is a cheap writing material. Why would you want a cheap writing material? What do you write anyway? Bibles. Bibles are the only thing you write. Who wants a cheap Bible? It's like saying that I have a cheap metal and I can make a crown for a king out of a cheap metal. No one's interested in a cheap metal for a crown, and no one's interested in cheap paper for a Bible. And so instead, Bibles were handwritten on animal skin. 
Now, as long as you are using animal skin, it is impossible to make the Gutenberg press economically viable. It just doesn't work. It doesn't work. And technically, it works. And Gutenberg Bibles have been printed on animal skin. But economically, it doesn't work. Because the whole idea of printing is you need a long print run, 1,000, 2,000, 4,000 copies of a Bible. I did the mathematics. I'm, I do maths. I'm an economist, right? If you're going to make 4,000 copies of a Bible, you need to kill half a million sheep. It's not going to work. And so, if you want mass-produced writing, you need mass-produced writing paper. And that, finally, was what arrived in Europe. In Italy, in the, uh, the 10th, the 11th century, where merchants used it to write contracts and letters, and then gradually it moved north. Uh, it, and it reached uh, Germany, it reached Belgium, it reached England. And it was only a few decades after it reached Mainz, in now, what is now Germany, that Johannes Gutenberg invented the printing press. So yes, the sophisticated technology, the complicated technology, it matters. But don't forget the simple stuff. That very simple, humble technology of paper is essential. Without paper, you can't have a printing press. And what is really essential about paper? It's very simple. It's cheap. It's so cheap, you can wipe, well, you can wipe anything you like with it. So I would like to propose a technological principle for you to take home with. It's the toilet paper principle. The toilet paper principle is once a technology is cheap enough that you can wipe your bottom with it, then it's cheap enough to change the world. Of course, there are technologies that change the world even though they're expensive, but usually, what makes the difference is they get cheap, cheaper, and cheaper, and cheaper. <coughs> so, where else do we see the toilet paper principle at work? Well, I used to work um, in the energy sector. I used to work for an oil company. And I see the energy sector being transformed now. This unbelievable fall, <coughs> excuse me, this unbelievable fall in the price of solar panels. Well, what is causing the fall in the price of solar panels? It's not a huge technological breakthrough. It's simple stuff. We're building them in a more modular way, like IKEA furniture. We're building them at scale. We have huge factories churning out solar panels. When you have a huge factory churning out a solar panel, the price will fall. And when the price falls, you change the world. It's the toilet paper principle all over again. Nothing complicated. Make it simple, make it cheap, change everything. The um, favorite example, much used around here, of, of economists, is of course the shipping container. Shipping container changed the world, completely transformed the world as a force of globalization. It's an 1850s technology, but it wasn't developed, wasn't rolled out until the 1950s. Keep it simple, keep it cheap, you change the world. <coughs> Excuse me, now, I said, there were two mistakes that we made, and they were both exemplified in that uh, Blade Runner sequence that I referred to. So the first mistake is the Rachel mistake. We focus on the most complicated technology. We fail to see how the simple technology, the cheap technology, is transformative. So what's the second mistake? Well, the second mistake is we miss social change. We miss the way that societies change and adapt to technology. And you can see that in the way that Deckard phones Rachel, this unbelievably sophisticated piece of technology, on a payphone, the hole in the wall. And you just put the coins in and make the call. Yeah? There's no recognition 
of the fact that if you have an organic robot in your midst, an artificial intelligence, everything else will change. And my favorite illustration of this is a British television program produced exactly 50 years ago. And I want to show you one minute from this television program, and I think it will show you exactly what I mean. It brings. So what's missing from this movie? I mean, apart from they got everything wrong, everything wrong. Actually, there's one thing they didn't get wrong, which is if you're left alone for 10 seconds, you want to press a button and check for messages. They got that right. And everything else is wrong. And why, why is it wrong? Basically, it's wrong because they are showing a 1968 office with what they imagine to be new technology. And nothing changes about the office itself. So you have these pretty girls, and instead of being in a typing pool with typewriters, they're in a typing pool with computers. You have the boss in a private office. He doesn't have any computers at all, except this weird moving desk thing. He's still wearing a three-piece suit. They're all still unmarried and highly deferential. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed about society, and that's never how it works. So I, I want to tell you a story about this, and this is a very well-known example, so you may have heard it, but I think that people often draw the wrong conclusions. So this example um, was brought to everyone's attention at about 1990 by the economist Paul David. Uh, he's an economic historian. And Paul David said, look at a photograph of a late 19th century American factory. Here's a photograph of a late 19th century American factory. Um, what do you see? Well, you've got these, all of these workers working on their benches, and all the power in the factory is coming from a steam engine, which is outside the building. And the power comes along a drive shaft along the ceiling. And you can see all of these workers drawing power from the same drive shaft via drive belts. And so the whole logic of the factory is determined by who needs to be close to the source of power. Then, um, in the 1890s, about the time this photograph was taken, efficient electric motors started to be produced, and entrepreneurs started to think, ah, oh, this new technology, maybe this can work for us. So what they would do, they would, <coughs> they would take the steam engine, remove it, replace it with the electric motor. They would change nothing else. And this improved the factory's performance in no way at all. It was a huge disappointment. Then gradually, people realized, if you have an electric motor, there are some other things you can change. In particular, you can have a hundred small electric motors instead of one large electric motor. You can't really do that with a steam engine. It's very inefficient. When you have a hundred small electric motors, the power comes through the wires, not through the shaft. Then that means you can take the shaft out of the ceiling. You can have windows in the ceiling. You can spread the factory out. 
You can rearrange the flow around the factory so that it's more logical. You can have a production line. But then you need to retrain your workers because they have more responsibility to control their own machine. In other words, all you need to do to take advantage of the new technology is build a new factory, hire new workers, retrain them, change your productive flow, and bring in complementary technologies, such as ceiling-mounted cranes. When you change everything, then the technology will work for you, and not before. Now, very often when people hear Paul David's story, what they hear is the technology was available in, 19, in 1890, and the productivity breakthrough was 1920. So it took 30 years. But the real lesson, I think, is not that it took 30 years. Maybe you could do it in three years. Maybe it takes 300 years. The point is it requires change. Without the change, without adjusting and adapting to the new technology, you don't get the progress that you want. And that change can hurt. So nearly 20 years ago, before he was famous for talking about artificial intelligence and the race against the machine and all of this kind of thing, Eric Brinch Olsen produced a study of this phenomenon in corporations. And he studied corporations investing in new technologies in computers in the 1990s and corporations reorganizing themselves. And this is a, it's a bit of a fussy graph, but let me tell you basically what it means. You move this way, that's more computers. You move back, that's more reorganization. You decentralize. You move up, well, that's more profits, basically. So if you reorganize and you don't invest in the technology, no profits. If you invest in the technology but you don't reorganize, no profits. If you do nothing, that's OK, actually, for a while. But it's only when you reorganize and you invest in the technology that the profits start to soar. So Paul David's idea about the 1890s still operating in the 1990s. And it's still operating today because, of course, it always operates. So what lesson do I draw from all of this? I'm saying two things, really. First, keep your eye on what's cheap. Focus on what's cheap, because what's cheap is what really changes things. And if it's not going to be cheap today, focus on what's cheap tomorrow or in 10 years' time. And the second thing, try to understand how society will change as a new technology comes into operation. It's hard to do that, of course. It's hard to predict the future. I'm an economist. I, I, I know I professionally fail to predict the future. That's my job, to get the future wrong. But one little clue, I think, that helps you forecast the social change is that first thing, to, to focus on the inexpensive technology, to look at the cheap technology. And cheap technology often changes one small thing at a time. This idea we sometimes have that Arnold Schwarzenegger's Terminator is going to walk into the office, shove somebody out of the way, sit down and start typing. It's never like that. It's never like, oh, um, although if he did, OK, I would, I would back away and he could have my chair. Instead, what autom automation takes one small task after another. What does a robot accountant look like? It's not Arnold Schwarzenegger with a calculator. It's actually a copy of Microsoft Excel. That's what a robot accountant looks like. And we still have human accountants. So what does that tell us to worry about? Since you know, I'm an economist, I'm supposed to worry. Well, a lot of people, when they think about technology, they seem to be worrying about this. They are worried about HAL 9000 from uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey, this supercomputer who will become sentient, who will take over the world, who will kill us, if necessary, to further its mission. I'm not worried at all about HAL 9000. That's not how technological change seems to work, as far as I'm concerned. I'm worried about a different kind of artificial intelligence. 
called Jennifer. And I should be clear, not uh, Geneva, Jennifer. Jennifer is, well, you may be looking at this woman and thinking Jennifer is this woman. Jennifer is not this woman. Jennifer is the earpiece that this woman is wearing. She's working in a, uh, in a warehouse, and Jennifer is simply telling her, okay, walk to aisle C, now down to section three, now uh, shelf A, and then on shelf A, you need to pick up 18 copies of Tim Harford's book, 50 Things That Make the Modern Economy. But they won't say 18 copies, they'll say five copies. One, two, three, four, five. Five more copies. One, two, three, four, five. Five more copies. Okay. Now three more copies. Okay. Why? Because the Jennifer unit can count, and that's something that human beings find difficult. But you know what human beings find easy? We can see. We can see our feet. We can see around. We can see items on shelves. We understand how hard to squeeze when picking up a book. And it's different from how hard to squeeze when picking up a bottle of wine. Yeah? It's, a, it's a really hard problem. Computers, robots, they struggle with it. Human beings find it easy. So what we see here, though, is exactly what I'm talking about. This is social change in action. What have they done? They have taken a very simple, cheap piece of technology, the earpiece, the Jennifer unit, and they have used it to replace this woman's brain. Because this woman now no longer needs to think. Because Jennifer can do the thinking, can track the stock, can count what's on the shelf, and can keep track of the orders. All we need is this woman's eyes and hands. So when I worry about technology, I don't worry about Rachel. I don't worry about HAL 9000. I worry about Jennifer. And my challenge to all of you, as you're thinking about how technology is transforming your lives, giving you new opportunities, giving you a chance to make money or to reshape your organizations, remember Jennifer. Remember Jennifer. There are ways to introduce a technology that make people's lives more creative, more fulfilling. The technology takes the boring stuff. But there are also ways to disempower people. And that choice, if we think about it, is ours. Welcome to Supernova, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Tim Harford.